This is episode 61 with Burton Snowboard CEO, Donna Carpenter. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. At the Outdoor Retailer Show in Denver a few weeks ago, I got the chance to speak with CEO of Burton Snowboards, Donna Carpenter. This woman is a true force of nature. We talked about how she became the CEO of one of the biggest snowboard companies ever, what it was like in the early days of snowboarding, how she met her husband, the irreverent culture they've created at Burton, sending women to the march in D.C., lessons in failure, keys to success, and so much more. If you want to run a business, work at a really fun company with a strong culture, love snowboarding, or just want to hear a woman speak about her incredible path, Listen on. Okay, so we're with Donna Carpenter. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. It's great to be here. It's really exciting to have you. So let's just start at the beginning. We're at a trade show right now, and you told me, and you've actually accepted this amazing award on stage last night, the Inspiration Award, that you guys used to not be allowed at trade shows. Yeah, you know, looking out at that room last night with all those industry people cheering for us, which is great. You know, I said it was easy to forget that how much people, especially in the industry, hated snowboarders. They just did. I was reminiscing about my first trade show, our first trade show, Burton's first trade show, 35 years ago, and we were exhibiting with a friend. We had sort of snuck in, I guess, and we were <laughs> subletting, if you will. And, you know, SIA, the ski, it was called Ski Industries of America at the time. They did change it eventually oh, snow to Industries. Snow Industries yeah. of America for a reason, right? But they literally explicitly told us, you are not part of this industry, you are not welcome here. And they actually sent some big union guys from the convention center to physically remove us. And I remember a little tossle, like I remember Jake sort of pulling the board back from this guy and and we were allowed to stay, but it was really clear. They were very explicit that we weren't welcome and they didn't see us uh, as part of the industry. And as you know, it was the same story with the mountains, you know, um, they didn't exactly welcome snowboarders with open arms. In the very beginning, we had to sneak onto mountains. And then later, we had to fight for every turn we took. Gosh, and now today, snowboarding is so welcome. It just, that time seems like so far away. You know, I say, I think it's, it is central to snow culture now because everybody figured out what we already knew, which... On. <laughs> is it's the best legal high there is, right? Amen. <laughs> That's so true. And I mean, you worked so hard, though, to get it to be where it was today. I mean, maybe you can talk about some of the things you guys had to do. I mean, sneaking onto the mountains, no joke back then, especially. Right. You know, I think that because we grew up in opposition to something, we grew up in opposition to skiing, who didn't want us at their trade shows, didn't want us at their mountains. We became this really strong community and it really didn't matter what snowboard was on your feet. We were all part of this tribe. It didn't matter what brand you wore. No, it really didn't because we were all fighting for the same thing. We were all fighting for the fun that we wanted to have, whether we were coming from surfing or skating or skiing um, or, you know, had this brand or the other. In the beginning, it was a lot of Sims and Burton competition, which I think, you know, really spurred us. Like I said, it made us work harder. We had to work longer hours, make better product because we were – you know, fighting for a whole Category, community. Yeah. 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 You know, it seems like snowboard culture, so much of it is kind of counterculture and really fighting for not only equality, but you guys are doing so much now for the environment and for women's rights. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that because you're doing so much. 
Yeah, I think because of our personalities and because we weren't welcomed by the existing ski culture, we developed a little bit of counter-ski culture, anti-establishment attitude. And what it did is it, it really gave us purpose and focus. And so we worked harder. We worked longer hours. We pushed the boundaries to make better product. You know, we worked with the ski areas. And, you know, now snowboarding isn't counterculture. It's a, it's a healthy part of the, the overall snow culture. But I think we still are counterculture, Jake and I and our DNA and the company. And, you know, I like to say now we're, we're still fighting back. We're fighting back against global climate change by radically changing the way that we're doing business as well as joining forces with Protect Our Winners to advocate for policy change. It's been our mission for 14 years to fight back against the lack of female leadership in our company and in our industry. Thank you for that. By yeah. the way. <laughs> and, you know, we, it's part of our mission to give literally thousands of teenagers of racially and ethnically diverse backgrounds, including recent immigrants, you know, the opportunity to grow and thrive through board sports through our Chill Foundation. So let's talk about the Chill Foundation, because I recently just took some kids from inner city San Diego snowboarding, and it was life changing. Yeah. They, their lives are Life changing. They like, we're eating the snow. I'm like, they live in San Diego, but not a lot of these kids, you know, if you don't leave a 10, 15 mile radius, you don't have access you to know, snow. You know, we have a program in Denver. We have, we're in 17 cities now and um, in North America. And I was at an event uh, last year and we asked a participant from the Denver program to come and speak. And that's what I remember. He he was saying that he grew up in Denver and he could see those beautiful mountains, but never in a million years imagined himself on it. Mm. And you think, how can a kid growing up in Denver not even cross his mind? You know, or or there's just zero opportunity. So so how many so you've taken how many kids? Snow we serve about two thousand a year. Wow, good for you. Because we have a uh, snow board program, skateboard program, surf, and stand-up paddle. I, I think that something's so powerful when someone says you can't or you shouldn't do something. <laughs> yes. And it's been a big impetus in my career when anybody's told me, like, you can't do something. I'm like, bring it for some reason. That, like, it's describes my husband, Jake. Awesome. Like, if you tell him he can't do it or... <laughs> I'd love to talk a little bit about your relationship. How do you guys oh, yeah. meet, if that's... Okay, talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We met at a bar on New Year's Eve nice. in, in southern Vermont. I was living in, in New York City going to school, and I thought I was really sophisticated. And um, I met this cute guy named Jake. And, um, you know, I never imagined um, that we would be married a year later. I was super young. I was only 19 years old. And... You know, I, I, I like to tell this story that I grew up, uh, I'm from a very small town in Texas, and when I was eight years old, my family moved to the suburbs of New York, and we were like fish out of water. And I didn't understand that culture, that suburban, wealthy, materialistic, shallow <laughs> culture, and I always felt like a total outsider, like something's wrong with me. Somehow my siblings could deal with it. <laughs> I feel that's so interesting. Similar experience. And it was, there was something about when I met Jake and he was just so decent and honest and hardworking and snowboarders were like a little tribe. Like I said, I was like, wow, here are people who share my values um, and we can make a living together and we can grow this thing. Together. So what did you start doing at Burton? Like what was your first job there? Well, um, you know, I used to help out, but my first job, it was interesting. I have to admit that um, after we got married, we got married pretty quickly. I found myself in Vermont going, oh, no, what now? <laughs> I'd been living in New York City, and I was like... That's and, a shock as well, yeah, Vermont. Yeah, exactly. It was a big culture shock for me. 
Um, and so this was in the uh, mid '80s, and Jake and I had both spent years abroad when we were in college, and um, he started thinking that snowboards could be made like a ski with steel edges and foam cores and wood cores and P-Tex bases, and um, and all of that production was happening in Europe in the Alps at the time, and still a lot of it is. Um, so he said, hey, what if we go to Europe for a year before we settle back down in Vermont and I can work on the manufacturing of the snowboard? And I said, great. And I actually got a job with another organization. I got a job with the Experiment in International Living, and I was going to be recruiting Austrian students for a program here in the U.S., and Jake said, hey, in the meantime, could you look at these inquiries that we're getting from Europe? And next thing I knew, I had declined the job, and I was setting up an office in Europe. I was setting up distribution. You were like 20? 24 years old. Wow, good for you. 24 years old. And I, I tell my kids that. I have kids in their 20s now trying to figure it out. And I was like, I was running a company when I was anywhere. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> Yeah, but again, it was sort of accidental. And I always say that I think one reason we were so successful in Europe, you know, the European market is as big as the U.S. market, um, was because I had no idea what I was doing. So I went to people and I said, how is business done here? You know, what will work here? How should we be doing this? How should we be approaching this? And doing business over there is different. And a lot of American companies would come in. I remember this one surf company saying to me, we're going to teach the Europeans how to sell clothing. I know who that, that company you is. I know who that is. And I thought to myself, you know, I think they've been doing it a couple thousand years before we have, you know. So my lack of experience, I think, actually helped because I was very open to saying, you know, hey, how do we become a real European company and not an American company doing business in Europe? You've become such a successful businesswoman. Is is one of those keys, you know, asking for help and learning to ask questions? I mean, that's that's hard for a lot of CEOs to do. Sounds you know, like I, I always say that I think the you know, the most important quality in a leader is learning agility. Mm. Being able to learn new things. I mean I often describe my leadership style as I have no idea, but I'll figure it out. You know, I've been put in charge of the European market. What? <laughs> you know? And then even recently in 2010 to 2013, I was in charge of our Japanese market. And I hadn't been in charge of that. And I didn't know. And, you know, so yes, I brought people who did know. I talked to people who did know. I reached out to all my contacts and I really spent time there. I immersed myself. And now I feel comfortable talking about the Japanese market. So I, I think it's learning agility and being able to learn and grow. And that's been one of the best things um, about my job. So Burton's culture is so strong. I mean, your employees seem so loyal when I talk to them on the phone, and I love that you're <laughs> privately held. How have you created such a strong culture there? No, I think that we naturally attract people who are passionate about the mountains in winter and, and snowboarding. And honestly, Shelby, I think we took that for granted for many years. Mm. And after the global economic crisis, which hit at the worst possible time as we were trying to sell through product of that year and sell in product, and, you know, we didn't even know if our bank was going to exist from day to day or whatever, you know, I realized we have a morale problem and it's partially our fault because we haven't done enough to really nurture nurture it. And so I did a lot of things. I... I blew up our HR department and, and restructured it. And what I heard from a lot of employees was, we want to know where you're going and what your values are and how we can help you get there. And I remember saying to Jake, I think we need a mission statement. And he said, well, we're anti-corporate, which means we can't have a mission statement. <laughs> so I actually spent a year developing something we call the stance. And it really is how we focus on the rider and what does that mean. And we have the same values on the mountain as we do at work and that we ride together as a community. 
And it's really given us focus. And out of that came, you know, we call it our trail map, which is our annual strategy. So I feel like I've been able to, in my leadership roles over the last sort of eight years, been really able to focus the organization, get people to understand where we're going. You know, it was kind of in our heads. Yeah. And you got to get it down on paper and how people, people really want to know. I think people really do want to contribute to something bigger than themselves. Yep. And that's what we give them. We give them something more meaningful to work towards as a team. One of the things you did recently that I thought was amazing was you sent women who worked at the company to the Women's March. Like, where did that idea come from and, and how did you guys do it? You know, I think after the election, we were all very rattled. I was in a fetal position for a few days <laughs> afterwards. And, you know, so I think there's that human instinct of, oh, my God, what can I do? What can I, you know, how can I have an impact? And when I heard about the march, it was instantly, oh, yes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be there. And then I thought, you know what? I should give every woman at Burton an opportunity to be there because we have been working for the last 14 years on gender equality. And I've got this incredible group of women who are so committed to helping the company move forward in that area. And, and so it was just sort of a natural, like, oh, I should include them. I do have to say, I, I went to Jake and I went to, to, you know, the president of the company and they were like, oh, are you sure you want to do this? Because, you know, you could piss off some customers. And I said, you know, I really don't care. This feels right. This feels like standing up, speaking truth to power and, and, and setting an example. And it was amazing. It was truly amazing. So what I did was I offered to pay for any woman to go down there, the travel expenses, the hotel expenses. We had the best signs. About 30 what of us. What were your signs? Well, we, about, about 30 of us went and marketing helped us with the signs. And there was like, you know, 1968 is calling, don't pick up. And, you know, we are nasty women and <laughs> things like that. So, but they're probably like super well designed and totally. Beautiful. We got the sign award, but it was, you know, it was really incredible. It was an incredible bonding experience. Jake put together a gift bag, an amazing gift bag for all of us. And I think it gave us that sense of, you know, solidarity with something bigger. And it's, you know, it's pushed us to really even double down on our, our own internal efforts. Good for you. I, I want to kind of know what's in this gift bag because I've heard Jake, I've seen the Christmas presents he gives out on Instagram and they look hilarious. I know this was pretty wild. So he really put a lot of thought into it. So there was like this Simon Pierce glass candle with the, with the date engraved. There was Gloria Steinem's new book. Wow. Um, I love that you guys are not afraid to go where <laughs> so many companies would be horrified to go today. You're not afraid to go political. And, and is, that, is that because you're privately held and that's what the brand stands for? I think it is because we're privately held. And I honestly also believe it's because of our current situation and our current culture. I mean, if you had told me 10 years ago that it would be businesses leading on issues like climate change and gender equality and transgender bathroom equality and... You know, I would have said you're crazy, but I think that given this political environment, businesses have realized, hey, this is going to be up to us. And like I said, we've been fighting a long time for climate change and changing the way we do business and for women's equality. And it just felt like such an affront. Yeah, it's, it's shocking every day. <laughs> yeah. I think also, you know, like I said, that lack of inclusiveness. I mean, I think inclusiveness is a really important value of snowboarders because we weren't included mm. in the beginning. You know, we had to kind of be our own little tribe, but we welcomed anybody in who was a little quirky or standing sideways or whatever. Yeah, you guys seem very inclusive just as a company. But yeah. When we first started talking before this interview, you talked to me about an experience you had when you realized that Burton was a family. 
more than anything. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's easy to be a family in the good times. And we were growing very quickly in the 80s, all through the 80s. And after I came back from Europe, I became CFO of the whole company. Have um, you had like finance background or? You know what? I had had finance experience okay. in Europe for four or five years. And the guy who was helping me run Europe was a finance guy and he was sort of my mentor. Yeah. But uh, this is, yeah, that's another story we could we could talk about. I think it was really always at every point in my career, it was Jake who said to me, you can do this. And I said, CFO, are you kidding? He said, no, no, you can do it. And even CEO, he asked me to be CEO five years ago. And I said, no, I'm not ready. Mm. So that's, um, that's another story of, of, of kind of having this cheerleader. And I think it's so typical of women saying, oh, I'm not ready. You just told me that. Yeah. <laughs> and that. even I realized that I did it. And he was the one who said, yeah, you know, you've had experience with budgets and forecasts and everything over in Europe. You've run a European company. You could be CFO of this company. So I was CFO and I negotiated a bank deal. Uh, we don't have any long-term debt. We just need short-term borrowing because we're buying everything in the beginning of the season and we don't sell it to the end. Um, so we're a very healthy company that way. But there was something called the um, savings and loan crisis. And it ended up putting about 1,200 banks out of business. Another example of people getting greedy and um, the whole thing kind of blowing up. And our bank was not directly affected, but they said, we're a $20 billion bank and we want to be a $10 billion bank and your portfolio is risky and we are eliminating all risky portfolios. So I, as CFO, had been asked not to borrow money for 30 days. That's very typical that you, you clean yeah. up for 30 days. I had kept us clean for 45 days, which I was very proud of. And I picked up the phone and the bank said, we have to talk. So I was seven months pregnant with my first child, and I had to walk around the office to 50 people and say, you can't cash that paycheck. Wow. And I remember, I'll never forget a single mom in our accounting department, two kids in daycare, and I'm saying, I don't know when. I will let you know when you can cash this paycheck. And the most amazing thing was nobody blinked. Nobody complained. You know, they all said, we believe in what we're doing, what you're doing and why we're here. And we can see that this isn't, you know, it was it's kind of outside of our control. It wasn't something that we had really yeah. screwed up. And they just waited patiently. I think it was just under two weeks until I got emergency bank funding. That's a testament to just how amazing this family is that you've created. So I think a lot of people listening right now are going to be like, I want to work for Burton. <laughs> how do I do it? <laughs> Any advice to people who want to work for a company like Burton? Like what sort of skills and traits should they have? And right now millennials are getting a pretty bad rep. Like no one wants to hire. Sorry, if you're a millennial listening, you guys are getting a bad rep. I'm part millennial. Just what sort of traits should people who want to work for companies like Burton have? Yeah, I think it's really important for anybody in whatever job they're pursuing or whatever career they're pursuing is to really understand the values of the company that they're going to work for and um, make sure that those align with yours. You know, for example, we work hard, play hard. That's just who we are. If you're looking for a nine to five job, that's not us. Um, <clears throat> we have a very outspoken culture. So if you are shy and reticent and are sitting back and waiting for opportunity, that's probably not the Burton way either. We, because we were started by entrepreneurs and an entrepreneur and a visionary, um, we look for very entrepreneurial people, you know, kind of who are naturally want to take ownership of something and drive it forward. What's what sort of what are you guys working on right now today? Like, what are Burton's biggest missions? Well, I think we continue that innovation is one of our biggest missions. You know, we disrupted Mountain Culture, 
and mountain sport through innovation. And I think the step on is a great example. Oh, yes. I can't wait to try one. Yes. But the step on was kind of around back in the day. It's just yeah, reinvented. Yeah, you know, it, was, it is reinvented. It's funny. Um, it was, I think it was five years ago. We worked on this for more than four years. And it was five years ago, and Jake was um, snowboarding with our head engineer. And he said, dude, I'm almost 60 years old. I've been bending over for 40 years. I've had enough. <laughs> but Sorry, my mouth. I know. But I want the same exact performance that I get from my buckle bindings. And so that was the challenge to the engineer. So for those of you listening, step-ins basically mean you can just step your boots right onto your board. You don't need to bend down, buckle them. I actually used a pair of them on a hydrofoil board 10 years ago. They're old school. Well, you know, we got lots of places where you can demo this now. So I'd awesome. love for you to demo it and okay, check it out. So, and, but I think, and like for women, I mean, I think that, you know, sitting on your butt, getting your pants that, wet it, sucks. It is a barrier. Yeah. It's a barrier. It's an obstacle. So I've really focused our whole, you know, kind of thinking around innovation to change like, hey, what do we think is cool to what problem do we need to solve? For the rider. How many women snowboard compared to men? It's about 60-40. 60, 60 men or 60 women? 60, 60 men, men, 40 women. Yeah. That's getting... It's getting better, it's Shelby, better. but I can't retire until it's 51%. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, ladies listening, <laughs> go Join to whatever the party. your local mountain is, demo some step-ins, and let's get you on the mountain. Your husband sounds awesome. And you guys seem like you have a really good relationship. What's it like kind of working with him? Well, I think, you know, any good relationship um, grows over time and is different over time. Somebody said to him the other day, they said, oh, my God, you've been married to the same woman for 35 years. And he goes, nope, she hasn't been the same woman for 35 years. That's good advice. Yeah. yeah. You have to change yeah. and grow. So, you know, in the beginning – there were times when it was very stressful. You know, being an entrepreneur sounds sexy, but then when you're in it and you, like I mentioned before, you are responsible for the livelihood of people and getting financing from the bank and stuff. And so there were, um, I mean, I think part of the reason we worked well together was we were handling separate parts of the business, right? He was doing product marketing and I was really the back end finance sales ops and but there in the in the beginning, I remember there was a period of time when it was very intense that we had to say, okay, we are not talking business after six o'clock. Because you mean you? It's yeah, all I'd day be otherwise. like, I can't get a bank loan, and he'd be like, I'm having a big product problem, and we'd just make each other miserable. <laughs> but after a while, again, I think it's because it really wasn't about us; it was about the sport, it was about the rider. You know, these days it's about sustainability and women's leadership. So um, there was always a bigger mission. Um, so it was easier to make decisions. And then, you know, I think I, I mentioned, you know, then, you know, he was running the company at, at, at the early stages. We got a great team coming in. And then he was my biggest cheerleader in terms of taking bigger and bigger roles in the company. I love that. So if you're working with your husband or wife or partner, whatever it may be, encourage them, it sounds like, and yes. draw the line in the sand. Be each other's cheerleader. Yes. I guess that's it. I mean, I could really see, I see today where Jake is incredibly valued, you know, developing the step on. Um, he tests every single product we make. He still does that. So, you know, figuring out how we both add value. It took me as the wife of the entrepreneur, the visionary, it did take me a while to kind of figure out where I could have, uh, you know, where I could contribute. It sounds like such a great company you've created. How far are you guys to the mountain, actually, the office? Well, we're about um, 35 minutes, but actually we live... Mountain. So you commute live on the to work. Nice. Yeah, we decided that we wanted to commute to work from the mountain. Good for you. That's, <laughs> that's the best. Right now I'm living at the beach and it's so nice. It's good to live like right where you can play because mm -hmm. you can work anywhere. And if you're getting paid, you're going to have to drive there anyway. This message was brought to you by Otessa. 
a series of outdoor events designed for women who long for a life of discovery and adventure. Whether it's committing to a three-day weekend retreat on a mountaintop or an energetic one-day outdoor festival featuring female artists, music, and speakers, Otessa has your outdoor aspirations covered. The great thing about Otessa is women from all walks of life come to connect or reconnect with themselves and each other in the outdoors. I'll be at some Otessa events this summer, and I'm super stoked to be part of this amazing event series. There's also some great brands involved who make this event possible and are helping lead various activities. So thanks to partners like Subaru of America, Garmin, Osprey, Sea to Summit, Smart Wool, The North Face, Hydro Flask, Pro Bar, Solomon, Maui Jim, Black Diamond, Yakima, Olakai, Roxy, Igloo, and Leatherman. To learn more about the REI Otessa events, head to otessa.com. That's O-U-T-E-S-S-A dot com. All right, Donna, this has been such a pleasure. We're going to go to the quick and dirty round. Okay. So any morning routines or things that you do that help you become more effective as a leader? Yeah, I think for me, what has saved my life in the last 10 years with everything I've been through is yoga. Love it. Yeah. What kind of yoga do you do? Do you do vinyasa? I do, or? I, I, yeah, an ashtanga. Ashtanga, okay. Yeah, but not... You're not super rigid with it. You have to... I understand. <laughs> That's great. I actually really like Ashtanga yoga. I think it's made me a better snowboarder. It's made me a better person. At work, I remember this one guy, after I'd started doing yoga for a while, he goes, wait, isn't this the part where you start screaming? And I said, <laughs> no, I'm going to start breathing. Good for you. And I think it's kind of changed. You know, you know it, it, yoga and meditation gives me that space where I don't have to react. You know, I can breathe and then process <laughs> and then react yoga is powerful i used to it make so powerful. much fun of yogis and then i went and got my teacher training yeah. to become a yoga teacher i mean i don't even teach but it's it is really powerful anything else do you meditate do you start your day like with tea or do you try to do yoga first thing i try to do yoga first thing and on some mornings i'll take a hike with my dogs mm. what sort of books do you gift most often or recommend? You know, I um, I saw that question, and that's a tough one. I love reading, and I love books, and I actually love mystery novels. Interesting. Yeah. Any I should pick up? So uh, my favorite is probably a writer named Elizabeth George. Okay, I'll check that out. I never read mystery novels. I know. I'm, I'm be good kind for of me. an addict. I think it, it just... You take know, you to another world. It takes I mean, me to yeah. another world. Your brain is going pretty strong all day. I think that would be fun to read a mystery What's your favorite mountain right now to ride? I would have to say Stowe, home, and you never know what you're going to get. The terrain is so variable. We can have powder. They have, you know, it's amazing. We have some backcountry runs at Stowe where you feel like you're out west. I bet everybody knows you there, too. Like, even the lift guys are probably just like, oh, it's Donna. Yeah, yeah. It's like you can just be yourself. (laughs) so fun. Um, If you guys weren't living in, in Vermont, where would you live? I would have to say back in Europe. Mm. And I would say because of the pace. Mm. I think the Europeans do a much better job of balancing work and life and taking time. I used to work with a guy in Europe who used to always say to me, take time, my friend, take time, my friend. You know, I remember when we were living over there, it was years ago, but you couldn't even get a coffee to go in Innsbruck, it didn't exist. And when you'd say, do you have coffee to go? They'd say, what, sit, have a coffee. And I think, you know, there's still, you see less of that frenetic pace that we tend to have as Americans. So I think I'd like to retire like in the Swiss Alps. Alps, okay. Northern Italy or. Mm. I actually just saw this funny Facebook video going around of how Italians drink coffee. And it's, it's always an espresso in a mug you drink it there. Yes. No to go. No, no paper cups. No. And, um, and, and, you know, like they don't even have cup holders in their cars. Oh, it's awesome. And we're like eating meals in our car. You know what I mean? So I think that if I had to live somewhere else, and I wouldn't want to live somewhere else because I do love Vermont. It's a very, very special place. Um, so we actually just had on Kelly Clark. 
And she I was, listened to it. She was awesome. Thank you for helping me set that up. You know, are you going to the Olympics this year? Yes. Anything you're looking forward to? Yeah, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got her a couple fifth, of riders. Her fifth Olympic. I think we have something like 30 riders. Yeah. Um, competing. It's pretty funny because, you know, snowboarding is so not nationalistic. You know what I mean? Like during the, you know, between Olympics, there's not like a U.S. snowboard team and a, you know, French snowboard team. So I remember at the last Olympics, we get all of our credentials through the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association. So I was standing with them at the half pipe and cheering for one of our Chinese girls, you know, awesome. and Jake's like, shh, shh. And I'm like, oh, that's right. You know, you're supposed to root for the United States. Um, so it's, you know, it's been a love hate relationship, I think with, you know, I, I know with, with snowboarding in the Olympics, but when you get there, you do realize that it's something special. It's the most exciting winter sport to watch, I think. Yes. I mean, I like it. I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> so, so Donna, we ask all of our, our guests this one question. If you could throw any party, what would you throw? Who's coming? What are we drinking and eating, eating? Who's playing? You know, Shelby, I already do it. Awesome. Um, about 35 years ago, maybe even a little more, um, Jake and I decided we wanted to get our friends, family, and employees together um, in Vermont, which we love so much, in the fall because it's so mm. beautiful. And so we started having these, we'd have touch football in the afternoon, and we'd have a pig roast and a band. And the first year it was 40 people at our house, and last year it was 1,400 <gasps> at our house. Wow. So it's called the Fall Bash. And it happens every, uh, the first weekend in, in October. And now, because so many of our employees have kids and stuff, the afternoon is like pony rides and bouncy castles and face painting. And then we actually have babysitters come in to take care of the kids. So and then we have a band, we have a skate ramp. We have, it's like, <laughs> so over the years, I've been able to create my perfect party and actually throw it. You guys are like the king and queen of fun. <laughs> Advice you would give to your 15-year-old self? Yeah, I think, you know, what we talked about before was I would tell her, don't worry, you're going to find your tribe. Mm -hmm. You're going to find um, people with your values. You might feel a little alienated. I, I would want to reassure her that it would be okay. And and one thing I really always tell, especially women, is we are responsible for taking care of ourselves. And that means holistically. That means physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. And I remember early in my career, I wasn't doing that. I wouldn't take care of myself physically. I would literally work myself into being sick. Um, or I, I really wasn't doing the yoga and meditation, so I wasn't taking care of myself spiritually or, you know, financially, really understanding, you know, I'm so proud that, like, during the economic crisis, Jake and I were able to go years without taking a penny out of the company because we had done financial planning. And, you know, so all those things, I think that... Um, women especially tend to kind of put aside are the things that you really need to make center in your life, taking care of yourself. Taking care of yourself and financial planning. I agree. Yeah. That's really well, I important. think financial planning is part of taking yeah. care of yourself holistically. You know, it means more than physical. It means spiritual. It means your relationships and, and all that. I think that's amazing advice. If the bottom of every snowboard didn't say burden, what would it say? If you could write one message to the world right now. Resist the new normal. I love it. Donna, thank you so much for coming on. This has been an incredible interview. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this show. Donna, thanks for coming on and sharing your wild ideas with us at the Outdoor Retailer Show in the podcast room. Thank you to REI for supporting this show. Definitely check out Otessa, O-U-T-E-S-S-A. -S Such a great event series. I'm going. You should go too. Do me a favor. Since this show is a labor of love, I'd love it if you could please write a review on iTunes. 
This is what helps us grow and get into the ears of so many more listeners. Here's a few reviews that recently came my way. One from Dr. Roctopus. This is by far my favorite podcast. The interviews and stories inspire me so much to make my life the one I want it to be rather than just going through the daily grind of a nine to five. So thank you so much for writing this review. Please write more. And wherever you are, don't forget, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We'll see you next week. 